9-17-10 Written by Bong Water Snowman A couple of months ago, I began my classes at Chicago State University. As I was preparing my freshman year, I was able to find everything I needed, except for a laptop. I'm not exactly very good at letting a dollar go for something, especially when I can get that something for less. I scoured the internet for good deals on laptops, finding none that suited my frugal habits. Classes were only two weeks away, and I was becoming desperate for a computer. Several days later, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a laptop that was being sold for only $600, and not too far from where I lived. It was a very nice Dell laptop too, seemingly odd that was being sold for almost $1,000 less than store price. I drove to the seller's address the following day. The house was farther out of the city, butting up to a dense forest. Outside of the house was an old Chevrolet, and a mess of old signs and various vintage-looking items. I rang the doorbell, and a thin man in a flannel jacket came to the door. When I asked about the laptop, he almost looked relieved, and told me that he was ready to sell it immediately. Luckily, I came with cash in hand, and after proof of good condition, I went home with a new computer. Excited to have my first self-bought laptop, I powered it up and began downloading my own programs and applications onto it. Upon searching the hard drive, I found a folder hidden away on it, which was odd because the man selling it told me that the memory was wiped clean and ready for a fresh start. The folder was titled 9-17-10, presumably a date. I opened the folder revealing six videos and three pictures. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to watch the videos. The first video was simply titled 001. The video was shot from a shaky camcorder inside of a vehicle, recording a woman walking out of a bar and getting into her car at night. After a couple of seconds, the woman drove off, and almost immediately, the person recording the video began to drive after her. The video ended after 24 seconds. It almost seems like the cameraman had been waiting for the woman for a while. Come to think of it, it wasn't too alarmed by this at this time, just a little unsettled. I opened the next video file, titled 002. I assumed that this was the next part of the first video. My assumption was right. As it began with the camera on top of the console, facing out of the windshield, it was raining now leading me to believe that this was a short while after the first video ended. I could barely make out the vehicle, two cars ahead of this one that was the same car that the woman left the bar in. This went on for the unsettling 47 seconds before the camera cut out. I began to get a little nervous, fearing that this might take a turn for the worst. But as if I was watching a television show, I wanted to see where this was headed. Not totally concerned yet, I decided to press on. The third video was of course titled 003. This was the one that got me officially concerned. The clip began from the same shaky hands as the first clips. It was now pouring rain outside of the car and I could barely make out a figure in a fur coat with an umbrella walking to the front door of a house. I could only assume who this person was and whose house this belonged to. The figure entered the house and closed the door. The following stillness greatly unnerved me. The only thing that could be heard was the sound of rain dumping on top of the car. After roughly two minutes of this nerve-wracking nothingness, the lights inside of the house cut out. Another minute or so went by before the camera was placed on top of the console again, and the sound of the person exiting the car broke the stillness. After the car door quietly closed, another figure, this time hooded, could be seen walking towards the house. I began to feel a knot tightening in the bottom of my stomach as the stranger walked around to the back of the house. Whoever this person was, they definitely weren't supposed to be there. After a couple of seconds, the lights to the outside of the house cut out. It was pitch black and only the rain alerted me that the camera was still rolling. The video ended after about 9 minutes of rain and darkness. I was now pretty sure that this was not an innocent little project, or anything of that nature, 
and I began to feel stupid for not checking this laptop seller's credibility. Was this person stalking the woman, the same person that I met with earlier? Throughout the whole experience, I had a dormant thought in the back of my head to call the police, but I wasn't ready yet. Reluctant now, I just began the fourth video, 004. It was dark again, but the rain had stopped and I was left with only silence. Not long after the video clip began, I could make the sound out of footsteps on gravel, getting louder as someone was approaching the vehicle. The door opened and the dome light was turned on, and I could tell that the camera was now on the floor of the car, pointing towards the roof. I heard some fumbling in the background, and suddenly a thump sound from the back of the truck. An arm abruptly obstructed the camera's view, and a large tarp could be seen being pulled out from the car. I had only one scenario running through my head, and I hoped that it wasn't true. The person picked up the camera and put it back onto the console and began to back up. They drove for a good three minutes before parking in a branched off road and exiting the car to work on the load that they were carrying. Six minutes after the car was moved again to a different location and the camera was picked up and carried underhand away from the car. I could see now that it was the same crappy truck that was parked out front the seller's house. I was about ready to call the cops on this creep when the camera turned around towards the house. It was a completely different house than the one I visited. I was a little relieved by this, though it didn't prove anything. As the fourth video came to an end, I was wondering whether or not I was prepared to see what came next. I could only hope that this was a prank, or at least had a happy ending. 005 began inside the house. It was extremely dark, and the only thing that I could make out was a figure that would occasionally walk in front of the camera. It was also quiet for the first few minutes, minus the occasional barking of a dog outside. Eventually a small sound started to appear. The small sound soon escalated to a loud, muffled scream. Shaking and struggling sounds became more apparent as time went on, as well as crying. A light abruptly came on, and the camera was lifted and panned to the center of the room, revealing a beaten and bloody woman tied to a chair. From what I could make out, this was in fact the woman from the bar. The camera zoomed in on her face for what seemed like an eternity before stopping. I couldn't believe what was happening. The original hope that this was a movie or something like that had long since diminished. With only one video remaining, I was beginning to fear for my own safety. I locked my door, closed my blinds, and pushed onwards. I began 006 with a small hope that this woman was still alive and that I could have her saved. The final installment of this horror show began in the bathroom setting. The camera was placed on the counter facing a mirror in which I could see a door. The only sound I could make was a familiar sound that destroyed my hopes, power tools. I sat in front of the screen for what felt like hours before the sound stopped. More silence, then, Heavy footsteps, accompanied by what sounded like something being dragged. The doorknob turned and the door was pushed open. Out of the darkness of the rest of the house appeared a middle-aged woman dressed in what I can only describe as lab attire, sporting a respirator and a pair of long rubber gloves. This, for some strange reason, gave me a small amount of relief. In the reflection, the woman struggled to drag something to the bathtub. As she hoisted it into the tub, I could see that it was a large black garbage bag. I felt like I was dreaming. It was like I was watching a horror movie unfolding on the screen. She lifted the bag up from the tub, now empty, except for whatever entrails that still dropped out. She picked up the camera and placed it on the ground facing the tub. On the floor in front of the bathtub was an assortment of corrosive substances and several other empty containers. The woman began to dump the liquids into the tub, which was followed by an awful, awful noise that I can only describe as pop rocks mixed with coke. The video ended and I was left bewildered and panicked. I finally opened the pictures. The first was a picture of the truck. The second was a picture of the girl tied up before she was beaten. And the third picture brought up a corrupted file notice, but maybe that was a good thing. 
I managed to keep the two pictures before I handed the laptop over to the police. I was reimbursed my $600 along with a bonus. Apparently the victim was the young girlfriend of the older woman's ex-husband. The older woman was arrested almost a year before but was freed from all charges due to a lack of evidence and the ex-husband was incarcerated instead. I guess this was the missing link. I hope that this has solved any unanswered questions. Although I'm not sure who the man was in the flannel jacket or how he got a hold of the laptop or how he owns the same trunk as the murderer. I guess I'll just leave that to the police. It's been about 14 or 15 years since this happened. There's a mountain right behind my family home. My room was on the second floor and it looked out towards the mountain. It was pretty amazing to be that close to something so beautiful. The public footpath that leads to the mountain goes by my window, so as nice as it was to have the mountain there, you also had to make sure, because you never knew who could be looking in on you. Back then I was still at school and I really liked listening to the radio while I was studying. I used to leave my studies to the last minute. I mean, who didn't at my age, right? So I'd be up late and I would hop around the radio stations because I knew if I put the TV on, I would be too distracted to study. I would listen to the radio, but only at a low volume because the rest of my family would be asleep. One night, it was past midnight, and I heard another noise beside the sound of my radio. I didn't know where it was coming from, because it was quite faint at first. I wanted to know what it was, so I turned down the radio and tried to listen for the sound. I realized what that sound was. It sounded like someone was descending the mountain. The footsteps were very light. Then my spine turned ice cold as I heard the voice of a child. I felt sweat line my brow. I didn't know what to do. Then logic came crawling back to me. It was too unrealistic. Why would a child be out there coming down the mountain path after midnight? I asked myself this question whilst listening intently. I heard the sounds of multiple pebbles skidding down the path. I could imagine the exact position where someone might be on the trail. Then I heard another voice. It was another child's voice. The voices seemed to mix and overlap one another. They grew quieter and quieter, as if they wanted to remain inconspicuous. What was stranger was the fact that the voices, although they seemed to be on the path which would lead them away from the mountain, never came down the path towards our home and towards town. The voices just seemed to linger in the darkness, just outside of my field of view. It was really scary at a young age to hear that. And another thing, I could hear the voices but I couldn't make out what they were talking about. They never sounded distressed either. There I was, scared stiff, listening to this sound and just as soon as I heard it, it seemed to fade out. The voices seemed to head back towards the mountains. I told my dad about it in the morning and he told me something which creeped me out and pulled at my heartstrings. In days gone by, this mountain had a series of huts built there. These huts were used during epidemics, such as tuberculosis, and infected families were sent into isolation to keep the majority safe and to prevent the spreading of disease. Some of these families had children, and it stands to reason that some of those children might have outlived their parents. Some of them might not have even been infected. Perhaps they wandered the mountain not knowing where they were, or where they were going to. Perhaps they stayed out there, away from the town that banished them, not wanting to leave their parents' side. I think that they're still out there. Of course, our house wasn't there back in those days, so perhaps they don't know how to get down the mountain with our house in the way. It's sad. The Thing That Stalks the Fields Credited to David Fueling It was a few weeks ago that the hay bales started creeping slowly away from the house. Every morning when I woke up, each had moved a few hundred feet from where it was before. I assumed it was some pranksters with nothing better to do, so I ignored it. Within a few days though, the hay bales began to approach the boundaries of the farm. I was tired of the whole game by then, and decided to move them back. 
It took a tedious hour to bring them all from where they were to over near the house again. And by the time I was done, I was ready to snap who's ever neck decided to screw with me. The next morning, I found each and every one of my horses messily decapitated. The smell was what woke me up. Each one was slumped over against the side of its stall. There were no signs of the heads. I spent the rest of the day cleaning up the mess and burying the remains. It was only when I was done that I noticed that the bales of hay had returned to their positions from the day before, scattered far out into the fields. This time I left them where they were. That night I sat on my porch with my shotgun in hand and a pot of coffee on the table beside me. I sat for hours, straining my eyes into the fields to catch a glimpse of whoever was moving my hay bales. Finally, I was beginning to nod off. I would have, but just as my eyes began to close, I heard a clamor and a rustling of trees from the nearby woods. I leaned forward, my heart racing with excitement. I was going to catch this guy. I fumbled with my gun and fidgeted in my seat, waiting anxiously for whoever it was to get close enough to ambush. It was only when things got close enough for me to make out its silhouette in the dark that I was frozen still. The thing that crept into my fields from the nearby woods didn't seem to notice me sitting there. It stalked, hunched and was deliberate, through the fields with the posture of a tiptoeing thief. If not for the fact that it must have towered over ten feet tall, even in its crouched position, it might have seemed almost frail. The thinness of its arms and legs, and the emaciated caved-in quality of its chest, reminded me of a starving animal. Still, this thing was undeniably strong, and I watched it hoist each bale up onto its arms with ease, and set it down carefully a while away, taking only a few strides to cover the distance. I watched it work, moving each bale thoughtfully. Every once in a while it would straighten up to look around at the other bale's positions in the field before adjusting the one it was working on, ever so slightly. Before it left it looked towards the house. I felt its eyes sweep over me in the dark, but whether it saw me or not, I couldn't tell. Then it turned silently and crept back the way it came, disappearing into the dark woods. It took me an hour before I had the courage to move at all. I went inside after a while, but didn't fall asleep that night. It was only when the sun rose that I dared to step off my porch into the fields. The hay bales were where it left them. Strangely, it didn't move them as far as it had the previous days. They were approaching something invisible in the fields, and as I looked at them, I realized that they seemed to be some kind of marking line. Indeed, as I walked around the house, I saw the distinct circle that they formed with me at the center. At first, I thought the bales were just haphazardly moved away from the house, but now I could see that they were instead being moved towards some type of boundary. The thing was sending me a message. I slept uneasily that night, and only because I was exhausted. The next morning, the bales hadn't moved at all. They didn't move at all for the rest of the week, in fact. They were finally where the thing wanted them. I made myself sick trying to interpret them. Why would this thing expend so much energy moving my hay bales and threaten me with such violence? Should I try to interfere? Killing my horses was just that, a threat, an intelligent threat at that. It knew that it would scare me and it knew that I would understand the implications. The sound of an automobile working its way along the road to my farm one morning gave me a little rush of excitement. I've been planning to abandon the farm since I saw the thing, but I couldn't have hoped to leave on foot without risking it treating me like it treated my horses. But if I could get in the car with whoever was coming my way, I might be able to escape before it could stop me. I didn't know or care who it was. I decided that the moment they stopped the car, I would jump into the passenger seat and tell them to get out of here. I didn't get the chance. The car worked its way slowly along the road, trudging across the uneven ground. I urged it silently to hurry. It was when it passed between the two bales of hay placed on either side of the road that I began to hear a booming clatter coming from the woods. The thing burst suddenly from between the trees, 
sprinting on all fours with its terribly gangly limbs towards the car. Within a few seconds, it was there, pouncing on the automobile like a predatory cat. Within moments, it was picking up and peeling the vehicle's steel frame apart, working to get at the driver. The man, whoever he was, screamed all the while and I could hear him, even over the crunching of metal and the shattering of glass. It was only when the thing crushed him carelessly in its hands that the screaming stopped. It tossed him away and straightened up and looked at me once again. In the sunlight, I could see the inhumanity of it. It was composed entirely of something awful and alive, which was lashed together in a messy semblance of a human form. Whatever it was made of, it looked polished and hard. That if it weren't for the minute writhing of the stuff, I think it was made of granite. The thing retreated back into the woods, and I was left to my shock. My eyes wandered to where the car sat, the engine still sputtering, between two bales of hay. Suddenly, I understood. The message was clear. I am this thing's captive, and I am not allowed visitors. Nothing may cross the borders it has set. I am trapped here by that thing that stalks the field, and it demands nothing except that I never leave. Still, I don't know if I can handle being that thing's canary. I've been thinking hard for the last few days since I saw it crush that man's chest and silence him before he could finish his scream. If I cross that hay bale border, it'd probably do the same. It had smashed my skull before I could put my hands up to protect myself. It'd go and find a new pet and probably keep looking until it found someone who could stand knowing that it was just waiting outside, watching it at all hours with its shiny insect eyes. I've been thinking hard for the last few days, and I might just make a run for it. This happened when I was in the third grade of elementary school. I really loved to fish back then, and I still love fishing to this day. It was school summer holidays, and I was going fishing almost every single day with my grandpa in a nearby stream. It was way out in the woods, in the shadow of huge mountains. The water was so clean you could see the fish perfectly, and there were a lot of fish. So one hot summer's day, I decided to go to this fishing spot by myself. I can't remember why I did this, maybe he said he was busy on that day or I was feeling extra curious or brave. It started as a great adventure for me. I loved the new sense of independence it gave me. I left home so early that morning that it was still dark out. I got on my bike with my fishing gear on my back and I headed towards the mountains. I'll be honest, I didn't know the way perfectly at that age. I spent some time riding back and forth up and down roads which didn't seem familiar. I didn't even consider turning back though, I was determined to go on a solo fishing trip that day. Thinking back on it, it was a really bad idea, I mean, I didn't tell anyone I was leaving that morning and they, like me, would have no idea where I was going. I could have easily got lost, injured, or worse. I found the entrance to the mountain trails, I remembered it because there was a stone Jesus statue there. Finally, I was ready to go fishing. I locked up my bike like I had seen Grandpa do a hundred times, grabbed my fishing gear, my water, and my snacks I brought from home, and I started heading down the trail. I walked for a while. I expected to notice something along the way which would remind me of the direction I should be heading in, you know, where to turn off or something, but nothing seemed too familiar. What didn't help was the fact that there was a thick morning mist out that morning. After a while, I heard the sound of running water and I knew I must be close to the stream. I pushed through the thick, dew-soaked grass and through a gap in the trees, and there it was, the mountain stream. I must have been beaming. I was so proud that I got there by myself. I felt so mature, selecting the little spot where I would set up my things. I took my time to get everything perfect. I was crazy about fishing. I fished, took a nap, had my lunch. Things were going swimmingly. It was great. I stayed there from morning to the afternoon. The sun must have moved to the other side of the mountain because my surroundings were getting dimmer and dimmer. I had caught a lot of fish, I pretty much had a full bucket. I was thinking to myself, I gotta get home and show this to grandpa. So I started packing things up, and it was at this point I sensed something. Something felt off in the area. 
Everything was silent, there were no noises from bugs, birds, wind or water. There was nothing. I'm the only one out here in the mountains, I thought to myself. When that thought arrived, it was followed by a tremendous sense of dread. Fear arose from somewhere deep down. I got my stuff together quickly, and I headed out of there as soon as I could. After all was packed up, I headed towards the slope to return to the original path and head out of the woods. I took one final precautionary glance back at where I had set up my fishing gear, and I was stunned to see that a man was now stood there. I don't remember much about him except for the fact that he was really tall, and he was wearing a straw hat. He stood there, still as a statue, staring at where I had been fishing, well maybe glaring is a more appropriate word. He looked angry. He had just discovered my fishing spot, and I felt for sure he was there to take my fishing spot. I don't know why I had that feeling, but I did. It felt like he was there to destroy or take something. I felt as if I had done something to upset him, so I instinctively ran before he spotted me. I was carrying too much, so I slipped and tripped over. I picked myself up and looked back towards the river, towards the man. I guess that I must have screamed or shouted as I fell because I realized that he was looking right at me as I got back to my feet. I hated his stare. His eyes were cold. I scrambled up towards the main trail and I walked as fast as I could towards the entrance. I couldn't run. I had brought too many things and on top of that I had a bucket of fish to carry. I thought that he would just leave me alone. I mean, why would anyone pursue a kid my age alone in the woods? He was about 20 meters behind me, and he shouted, Oi, at me. It wasn't an angry shout. It was something, it sounded like he was trying to be nice actually, but I wasn't going to stop. I had seen that glare of his, and I had felt that gut feeling. I was getting away from him. I was determined. Wait, he called. The tone was different this time. The second I heard that, I knew that it was time to run. I ran as fast as I could for about 10 minutes. I remember the sweat beading down my forehead, getting into my eyes. Both of my arms weren't free. I had all the gear and the fish to bring back. It had gotten darker too. I really wanted to go home. I wished that my granddad or my parents were here. I had to stop running. I had to take a break. <sighs> How long can you keep that speed up, kid? Just wait. I just want to talk to you. I heard him call from behind. He had been walking this entire time. He had wanted me to use up my energy, I guess. I mean, an adult could easily catch up to a kid my age if they really wanted to. The sun had been replaced by the moon in a matter of moments. This definitely didn't seem possible. Even my young mind understood that. Looking back towards the man yielded a sightless view of nothing but darkness, but amidst that darkness came the shuffling of feet. He was still coming after me. I was getting breathless. I knew that if I didn't run that I would never make it home. There was something walking in the dark right behind me. Maybe human, I don't know, but there was something there in the dark and it seemed invisible. I heard that Oi again. It was closer now. It was the voice of the man in the straw hat. I just kept running. Just keep running. Just keep running, I told myself. Tears were in my eyes now. I wanted the man in the hat to leave me alone. I didn't like that I couldn't see him. I really didn't like it. I didn't like him. I shouted, I'm sorry. And then from behind, I heard, <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. I ran down that mountain as fast as I could. I don't remember much after this point. I didn't even bother trying to get my bike, I just ran as fast as I could. When I got home, my parents were so angry with me, and rightly so. I was covered in mud and cuts and scratches, so I think that they had some sympathy for me. I remember not being in as much trouble as I thought I would be. I dropped the bucket of fish along the way and a lot of my fishing gear. I couldn't even brag to my grandpa about my haul. I didn't tell anyone about the man in the woods. I think that if anyone went looking for him, they wouldn't find him. He seemed to be as old as the woods, or at least a part of the woods. I don't know why I feel that, but I do. I was banned from fishing for the remainder of the summer. 
which I guess I understand, but I wish that my parents had chosen to punish me in some other way because, sadly, Grandpa passed away by the time the following summer rolled around, and we never got to go fishing again. I didn't ever fish along that stream again. That stream is a place where some of my most cherished childhood memories were created, and where some of my worst nightmares were born. The woods are a magical place. I always think of the good and bad times during the summer. Come here. Translated by J Nightmares. When I was in elementary school, I went to the countryside often with my family. My wider family were big fans of taking long nature walks. My dad's side of the family were mountain climber enthusiasts, so I had a lot of opportunities to play outside with my cousins. This experience takes place one late summer evening. I had been running around with my cousins playing games on and off the mountain trail. I was running off ahead from them and hiding behind things and when they approached, I would jump out and attempt to scare them. They were a little bit older than me and they wouldn't scare easily but I really wanted to surprise them, at least once. I think they were quite content to let me run ahead and hide so they could carry on with their high school kid conversations. Each time I ran ahead, I tried to make my hiding place more and more difficult to find, and this would prove to be my downfall. I went too far off the mountain trail and got turned around. Before I knew it, I was deep in the dark woods, with no idea how to find my way back. I think I got lost when I mistook a different trail for the main trail. I followed this winding trail deeper and deeper into the woods. As evening turned into night, I felt tears well into the corners of my eyes, and I realized that I couldn't fight those tears back any longer. The realization that I had lost sunken in. I had fell to the seat of my pants and just started wailing. I don't think my mind at that age could comprehend how hopeless the situation seemed. The final rays of sunlight slipped behind the dark, towering mountains and night fell all around the forest. I remember screaming my cousin's name, alone in the darkness. I was so hoping that they or anyone would answer. My voice grew hoarse and I put my hands together and began to pray. I was utterly terrified of what might happen to me out there in the wilderness. I stood with my back against a tree trunk, watching the night sky turn pitch black. I was hoping that in a matter of seconds, a grown-up would find me. And that's when I heard a voice. Come here, they called. I didn't recognize that voice. It was not one of my cousins calling out to me. As I looked for the owner of that voice, I felt a strong tug on my wrist. Even though it was dark, I knew that there was no one around. It just didn't seem possible. The grip wasn't that strong, and... It was warm. It gave me a strange sense of security. Whatever was holding my wrist didn't make a sound, but I instinctively feel as if it was a humanoid. I think I was talking, but it wasn't replying. I just remember feeling really safe. We started walking and we didn't travel along the usual trails and paths. We went through the trees and the thick brush. The branches scratched me as we moved. Whoever was guiding me clearly knew the way. In what felt like a matter of minutes, I saw lights, the lights of people's houses, and after a while, I managed to recognize some. I saw a billboard, which I recognized. I knew when I saw that that I wasn't far from my grandpa's house. I felt the pressure release from my wrist as we stepped out of the forest tree line. I turned back to look, now that we were more in a light area and I turned to say thank you. But whatever pulled me out of the woods was long gone. I just stood there, staring at the darkness beyond the trees. I didn't want to be anywhere near that darkness anymore, so I kept moving. But then, I stopped. I really wanted to thank whatever saved me, and I felt as if it was still around, just hiding by the dark. 
I stood there for a good three or four minutes, yelling thank you in all directions. Then I ran. I ran back to my grandpa's house. After the initial relief, and I guess the joy of seeing me return home safe, my family began to question me. They were incredibly worried and scared them they would never see me again, so they needed to know what happened. I told them what had happened and they proceeded to make fun of me. My cousins were the worst. They said that I made it up because they had never heard of a cryptid or a monster from the mountains of Japan, which helped lost people. Well, it did happen. I just don't know how else to explain it. I wish that I could put into words the feeling I felt in those moments lost in the woods, but I cannot. All I can say is that I'm eternally grateful because, you know, there but for the grace of God. I have heard this story end differently countless times. I could still be missing somewhere in that forest, and that thought really frightens me. This happened when I was in university, when I was driving home from a trip. The roads were really dark as I was in the countryside. The mountains and trees were blotting out the moonlight. All of a sudden, my engine began to splutter and slow until it eventually came to a stop. I'm not the best with cars, so rather than waste any time with guesswork, I figured I'd call Roadside Rescue. I had that as part of my insurance. There was nothing much I could do except wait for someone to arrive. It was creepy out there. The forests are home to strange noises at night. After a little while, a bright light lit up the road and it was aimed at my car. I thought that roadside rescue were early. I couldn't believe my luck. But when the light got closer, I realized that it wasn't them. It was strange. It didn't look like the light of normal headlights. It stopped about 50 meters in front of my car and didn't move. It was getting a bit weird now. Unlike standard headlights, which were divided into two light sources, whatever was in front of me had only the one source of light. That light was so bright, it didn't seem safe at all. It seemed not to have the same purpose as a light bulb. I didn't like it. And then I saw them, three people approaching from behind the light. These were very thin and very tall, pushing two meters, I'd say, six foot six. As they moved from behind the light to in front of it, I could see the lines in their face. Their faces were really gaunt and long. There was something off-putting about these three people that I couldn't quite put my finger on at first, but then I realized what it was. Their style of clothes and hair, etc. They looked like they were from another time period. It was like they had been wearing the same clothes since the 70s. They were wearing chinos, polo shirts, stuff like that. They approached my car and one of them spoke to me. Once again I noticed there was something slightly off-putting about these people. When they spoke, it had all the wrong intonations. Like, he was emphasizing the wrong syllables. I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but it, it just wasn't right. It made listening to them difficult. Yet, I detected no accent to indicate that they were foreign. Where did you come from? He asked. I chose to remain silent before answering that. I didn't want to let these strangers know about my car's engine trouble, because essentially, I couldn't get away from them. You have a trouble with your car and I can fix it, he said. It scared me that he knew that. I said thanks, but no thanks. I had already called roadside rescue. The man was persistent. They kept refusing. I really didn't want to speak to these guys out here in the woods alone. Then the strangest thing happened. My thoughts felt like they were changing. Like I had to mentally wrestle with myself not to allow them to work on my car. It felt like my mind was being changed for me. I started to wonder if maybe they could help. Maybe it would be a good idea to unlock the door and let them in. I got out of my car half of my mind screaming at the other half imploring me to get back into my car and get the doors locked again i couldn't fight it i started following them towards the light i was completely transfixed i didn't 
need to think for myself. I tried to raise my arm, but I couldn't because I wasn't in control of it. I wanted to be scared, but this calm voice inside my head reassured me that there was nothing to fear. That part of me was still screaming. To do anything I could to get away from these men, but... That internal voice of mine was getting quieter and quieter. While I was walking towards that bright light, my phone started to ring. It must be the roadside rescue people. It snapped me back to reality. I was in control again. I was able to answer the phone. I was back. I knew that that phone needed to be on. Something about that call saved me. I must have explained my location in about ten different ways to the rescue people. I really wanted to be accurate. I didn't want to be out here anymore. Whilst I was on the phone, the men were trying to get me to take up their offer of help. I hated the way they towered over me. In their faces. They were so pale and thin, like barn owls. I refused. I had to. I ran back to my car with my phone clamped to the side of my head. And that was when they began to get angry. They were screaming and shouting by the side of my door. I began to doubt myself. Usually I would never refuse a kind favor, as I would be willing to do the same for someone in my situation, but given what just happened, I knew I couldn't trust these men. They were trying to express anger, but it was like the concept was entirely new to them. Eventually they gave up and headed back towards the beam of light. Before leaving, they did this weird thing simultaneously in front of my car. They placed an open palm on their foreheads and then slapped it. It's like as if you're doing a high five to your own head. Their fingers were long and spider-like. I don't have a clue what that gesture is supposed to mean. The light then shot backwards at tremendous speed and it was gone. Shortly after, the roadside rescue team showed up. The guy went to check the engine and couldn't find a single fault with it. He put my keys back in the ignition, turned it, and my engine started without issue. That really freaks me out because I know that my engine stopped. I hated it, but I needed to get out of the woods. I headed in the direction the light shot off in and managed to get home without any further incident. However, when I woke up the next day, I had a really strange rash all over my body. I went to see a dermatologist and he couldn't figure out the cause of the rash. I think the rash went away after 10 days or so with the cream and ointment I got from the dermatologist. I am sure that that rash was related to the bright light and those three men. Well, I say men, I'm not entirely convinced of that fact. About two years after this happened, I was at a party and a woman said that when she was driving out in the mountains, in the same area that I was with her boyfriend. They said they saw something similar to what I did. She said on two occasions she saw beams of light flying across the night sky. Some people snickered at that, but I didn't. It felt all too real. Did we have some sort of encounter with a UFO? It must be really hard to believe this, but I wish I could just, uh, just give you my memories or my mind for a while. The fear those three tall men instilled in me was otherworldly. That said, I don't know why my mind changed to trusting them like a light switch being switched on and off. It lingers in my thoughts often. It was truly disturbing. What if it comes back? Translated by J Nightmares. This happened when I went on a fishing trip with my dad. My dad absolutely loves to fish and he would always invite me. I like fishing sure, but I guess I wasn't as passionate as he was about it. He loved mountain stream fishing, and I will be honest, that was probably my favorite too. So, on the first day mountain fishing was an opportunity to do so, we were ready to go. This all happened when I was in elementary school, by the way. I think that I was around six. I remember it very well, not only for the reasons that will be clear shortly, but because it was the first time we've ever went deeper into the mountainous woods. We would never go that far before, but I think that the year prior yielded a fruitless fishing haul, so my dad wanted to go into search of a new fishing spot. The stream we used was in a secret amongst anglers, and there'd always be a bunch around dotted either side of the length of the stream. It was common to see tens along the sides of the streams. These number grew less and less the further you went into the darker woods. The mountain provided that darkness, 
The much needed shade was welcomed, but with darkness came fear, especially for a boy my age. I knew that the mountain stream fishing wasn't as peaceful as it seemed. There were dangers everywhere, and I thanked my dad for making me aware of them. You could fall, get lost, get injured, wind up in distress, and could also encounter a wild animal, such as bears. My dad and I had a radio for these instances, and bear repellent. My dad actually used to bring fireworks out as well, you know, like firecrackers or something. He believed that this would frighten off something or alert someone to our position so we need it. He took all manners of precaution on our fishing trips, and I'm glad he did. So that day we were out in the search for the perfect fishing spot, and it seems that we had found it. We could see that the stream was teeming with life. There were fish everywhere. We approached it from above, and all we had to do was descend the mountain a little. So that's just what we did. We hit it down with big grins on our faces. On the way down, I noticed something. There was a tent. There was a smell in the air also. It wasn't great. It was pretty awful. Food containers, clothes, and other personal items were scattered around the tent. The tent was ripped too. Something was wrong, and even to my young mind, I knew that what had happened. This was the work of a bear. We had no idea if the bear was still nearby. With that thought at the forefront of my mind, I began to tremble. My dad kept walking, although he had stopped speaking. He was approaching the tent. I thought if he was going to see if the man in the tent was okay. I was certain that the man in the tent must have been dead. There was so much destruction around. It was a harrowing scene. My dad stopped, turned to me, and said, Don't touch anything. Nothing at all. The bear will be back. We have to go. I can't describe how I felt on the way back to the car, but I felt like I wasn't living, just existing. Like life in me was on pause. I'm not sure if that means anything to anyone, but hey, that's how I felt. I have never been conscious of death until that day. Death was so cruel. Nature was so indifferent. We found out once we reported the tent to the mountain ranger that the man was indeed dead. They believed that the bear was still out there. There's nothing much more I can say, but be careful when you're out in the mountains and the woods. Keep your wits about you and survey your surroundings. Satellite Navigation, translated by J Nightmares. This is a true and mysterious event which happened to me and some friends one summer night a few years ago. Every summer, a couple of old school best friends and I get together and we go on a little trip together. On the year that this occurred, we had all decided on renting a cottage in the woods. It's going to be great. We were going to have a great barbecue and a campfire. It was the usual crew, me and two other friends. We were all females, by the way. My friend drove and it took us hours to get there. It was already evening by the time we got to the cottage, and we were all in a hurry. We had prepared for this, though. We had brought all the barbecue gear and we were ready to feast. We had a great night, chatting and reminiscing by the log fire, and of course eating way too much. Even though it was summer, the sun had already set by at least eight, so... That was our call to head back into the cottage. It was a real shame though. I had suddenly had the urge to go to the hot spring. I know that this sounds a little bit odd, but it's called an osun in Japanese. And we all love going to them in the summer. I mentioned it to the others and everyone was on the same page. We got fired up since we were all tired and full. Well, the cottage didn't have a hot spring, so we hit the dead end. Not wanting to slow down or waste the trip, I got my phone out and started googling to see if there were any springs nearby, and we were in luck. There was one only a short drive away. We quickly packed up some clothes and jumped back into the car. Since we weren't familiar with the area, we were dependent completely on the car navigation system. The narrow roads were so dark since the forest was all around us, I didn't want to get lost out here. I was starting to lose faith in my idea, but then we turned into the highway road. The mood lifted in the car, and we were back to chatting and laughing. Right. The satellite navigation system interrupted. It was just one word. 
I noticed this because usually the satellite navigation system says, after 100 meters, turn right. I thought it was odd, but I didn't care that much. Another odd thing was it asked us to turn while we were in a curve in the road. We turned back a little, and at the exact same point in the road, the satellite navigation system said, right. These country roads were very narrow. We didn't see the dirt road the first time, but we spotted it when we doubled back. We obeyed the satellite navigation and turned down it. The laughter and sense of excitement in the car ebbed away and was replaced with a sense of anxiety. This road, it didn't seem like it was leading us to a hot springs. The forest road just got steeper and steeper, and darker and darker. I felt as if we were moving further away from town and from people. I started to doubt the existence of the hot spring. We ceased talking at this point. The air in the car was thick with tension. I wanted to turn back, but I knew that we couldn't. The road was only just wide enough for our car. There was no way that we could U-turn. I started to worry. I wondered what might happen if an oncoming car came at us full speed. Since we didn't know where we were, we decided that we would stop and check our surroundings. I was amazed to discover that we were nearing a cliff's edge. I had no idea that we had driven this high up into the mountains. I was lost for words, and so were my friends. Fear now had a grip on us. Forget the hot springs, we just needed to get back to somewhere familiar. No one said a word, and I'm glad that they didn't, because I was just panicking. We just stared at one another's faces in the dark, and wondered what to do. We had no choice but to keep going forward, because the road was simply not wide enough to turn back. I knew deep down that we were moving further and further away from town, the people and the lights. Just as our anxiety reached its peak, my friend spotted a point in the road up ahead where it widened. Relieved, we sped towards it to perform that U-turn that would get us out of the mountain woods. Then the car headlights illuminated a building. A building almost crumbled into ruins. A derelict and frightening looking place and in that moment, we laid eyes on what we heard. You have arrived at your destination. Then the power in the car went out. We panicked, but it came back on instantaneously. We turned around and headed back to the safety of the cottage. There was no hot springs. There was no way that that creepy building in the woods could have ever been a hot springs either. I cannot forget that event, and we often talk about it when we meet up. Perhaps we were summoned or called by something in that abandoned building. It was so scary. The Bonfire Translated by J Nightmares Camping in the Mountains Submitted and translated by J Nightmares this happened when I was in the second year of college. Seven guys, including myself, went camping, and I want to share with you what happened. We had this friend in the group who came from the countryside. He said to us that he knew some little place out in the mountains where we could all hang out during the summer vacation. He said that we would get to camp out by the mountain stream, so we all piled into two cars and headed out to the place he recommended. We drove for three hours. Our countryside friend told us that once we got on the highway, it would only take us about an hour, and even then when we got off the roads, we still had to hike up the mountain trail. It took us about 30 minutes, but it felt like forever after that long drive. Some of those mountain roads were so narrow and overgrown that I was praying that no one was coming in the opposite direction. One of the friends in my car remarked on how overgrown it was, to which my countryside friend said, yeah. No one knows about this place. It felt good, you know, like we were on an adventure. After a while, the mountain stream our friend promised us came into view. It was amazing. It was surrounded by the mountains, and it felt like we owned it. I don't know if that sounds a little arrogant, but that's how I felt. There was even a waterfall, and it wasn't a small stream. Maybe I should call it a river. It was wide in parts. We were alone. I mean that in the sense that we felt completely off the grid. I liked the idea until I noticed a building jutting off onto the mountains on the west. It looked like a school. 
We settled in after pitching our tents and had some lunch. We played around in the river and when the sun began to set, we lit a campfire and drank. However, the snacks and the booze ran out quicker than anticipated, so we split up. One team went out on a booze recon mission and the others minded our campsite. This happened around 10 p.m. I did not volunteer to go to the store. I was just fine with just sitting around. We had no torches. We watched as our friends headed off under the watchful light of the moon in one of the cars. We turned on our headlights of the other car so that we'd have some light. The stars were beautiful, and that night was filled with chirps of insects and the steady flow of the mountain stream. One of my pals broke the silence and said, What's that? I looked in the direction he was facing. He was looking at the school, and I saw that there was some kind of light coming from over there. It looked to me like someone was walking around with a flashlight. We spoke amongst ourselves. Someone said that they thought that there were some people out there doing some urban exploration. Someone else said that there was only one flashlight, so they doubted that. For the briefest of moments, it felt like the flashlight landed on us. We weren't far away enough to not be seen. Then the light went out. I figured that it was probably just a security guard or a janitor, but... My countryside friend said that the school was closed. We were all in high spirits, but now our enthusiasm was ebbing away. We all fell silent. It was already past midnight and our friends hadn't come back yet from the store, so two others from our group said that they'd go and search for them in the other car. Without the headlights, we could only rely on the campfire for light. My friend and I were the only ones left at the campsite, and after a few moments, he turned to me and asked, Sorry, bud. Can I go to sleep before you? I'm so tired, man. He didn't wait for my reply, he just went into one of the tents nearby and settled down for the night. It sounded like he fell asleep, almost instantly. I was alone. I watched the campfire. It was getting pretty creepy out there in the middle of nowhere. Our gang of seven was now down to just one. Me. After a few minutes, I noticed something. I saw a light coming from the direction of where we entered in our cars. I didn't see headlights though. The lights looked like they're about 100 meters away. I realized that it was coming from the woodland trail. It looked like it could be a flashlight. I started to get worried. I kicked dirt over the fire and climbed into the closest tent. Unfortunately, it wasn't the one my friend went in to sleep. I put a sleeping bag around me. I had a bad feeling about whoever was approaching, but I kept my eyes on that light. I hoped that it wouldn't notice our campsite. I could see it as it moved as if it was handheld. I started to wonder if it was the janitor or the urban explorer that we saw earlier at the school. I wondered why the heck would someone be out here in the middle of the mountainous forest at this time of night. I piled on some bags around me to create a little barrier, and then I stayed as still as I possibly could. I was sure whoever was out there wouldn't approach a tent that was zipped up. Surely they'd realize that someone was sleeping or camping. I was wrong. I heard footsteps approach the front of the tent, followed by the chilling sound of someone unzipping the tent door. Then, an old raspy voice spoke. You're not here either. I had goosebumps. I realized that it wasn't some janitor from the school. The voice belonged to an old woman. The old woman left my tent and then approached the tent that my friend was sleeping in. I didn't dare open my eyes, but I could hear her muttering something as she passed by. I knew that I wouldn't be able to catch a wink of sleep that night after the mysterious old woman decided to visit our tents. I lay there, with sweat amassing my brow, listening to the distant flow of the stream and the steady chirp of the night insects, praying for morning. Praying. For light. It was a long night, but when the first rays of the morning light illuminated my tent, I got up and went to see if my friend was alright. Thankfully there was no one out there. I looked in the tent and saw that he was sleeping. I decided not to wake him. Neither of my friend's cars had come back that night. 
I started to get very worried for them, but after about 10 minutes, I saw them both return to our campsite. I asked them what had happened, and they said that the first car got punctured, and the second car, which went to look for them, got lost on the mountain roads. I told them all what had happened last night, and no one believed me. We were all set to camp out again that night, and they all thought I was just trying to scare them. I didn't want to stay there for another night, but I had no choice. I didn't drive there. I got a ride and it wasn't like I could walk back home by myself. Reluctantly, I spent another night out there. It was an uneventful night and the following morning we all piled into the cars and headed back home. I purposely sat next to my friend who went to sleep early that night. The old lady came to our campsite. He hadn't mentioned anything about it and I wanted to know if he slept through it or if he didn't want to tell the others because they hadn't believed me. I said to him something like, did you hear what I said happened on the first night? I bet you're glad you went to sleep early, huh? I wasn't asleep, he replied. He said that like me, he decided to stay as silent as possible. He said that the old woman actually went inside his tent, grabbed him, and shook him. He opened his eyes a little and saw that he wasn't dreaming, and terror gripped him. He saw the old woman looming over him and attempted to shake him awake. He was so scared, but he said that he couldn't do much else but pretend to be asleep. She was mumbling the whole time. He said he couldn't make out many of the words, but he said that he'll always remember one sentence. The old woman said, I don't know where my children have gone. Many years have passed since that summer, but I wonder if she's still out there. Even though I don't know her intentions were either good or bad, but I somehow feel bad for the old lady. The poor woman sounded as if she'd been out in the woods for a while. I always think about that night when summer rolls around.